Well, good morning. So very, very glad to see you here this morning. We want to welcome you. If you're a guest of ours here this morning, we want to make sure that you got a packet of information that lets you know about our church, and uh, we want to certainly welcome you. And um, well, it is fall. It's a little chilly this morning, so but we're glad to be here to sing and worship and to praise our Lord. We want to make sure that you're aware of a number of things. Next Sunday, we get to fall back, so those that enjoy the daylight savings time uh, gets the benefit next week to sleep in an extra hour. So. Nothing? Less, less. No excitement? Most people get more excited about falling back than going forward. So, anyways, um, Emily has an announcement for us this morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to let you all know, parents specifically, that we have our Christmas program coming up. I know he just said happy fall, so sorry to start the Christmas a little early for you guys. But that will be on December 19th, so we need to start rehearsals today. So that will be immediately after the Sunday school hour. So teachers, if you could help me out by getting your kids into Nick Johnson's room at about 1140 to 1145, that would be great. And then parents, if you could pick them up 15 minutes after, that would also be appreciated by me and all their teachers. So I will be posting the songs on the Women's Ladies page, so if you need access to that you can talk to me or talk to brenda mom either one <laughs> thank you uh before we turn to the word of god i want to make sure that everyone sees brian i just saw him where did he go brian thorburn oh there he is brian thorburn is back from um completing his uh, marine boot camp so congratulations on that and we're very glad to Glad to see you here this morning. Well, it is time to meet God, so uh, we are turning to Revelation, the very last book and the very last chapter, so chapter 22. And as you're turning there, if you'd please stand with me. Revelation 22, our continuation in the, this wonderful area of Scripture. Starting at verse 1. <clears throat> and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on the other side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and, the, and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall, 
be no night there. <clears throat> they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they, sh and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God and the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must, must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is, blessed is he who keeps the words of, of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshipped before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He, is who, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with, with and my reward is with me, to give me, <clears throat> to give every one according to his work. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the last, the, f the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, and they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves the practices, a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let them who, who, who hear say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away the words of this of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part and part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. E Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You may be seated. The room will be quiet as we continue to prepare our hearts to meet God. Let's pray together. Father, we come here this morning as a family to worship you, to praise you, and to learn from your word. We pray as we're here, we'll focus on you, not on the things that we read this morning or thinking about what we're doing this afternoon, but Lord, just help us to focus that we might be able to become more like Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, church. Good to see you on the Lord's Day. As we read in Revelation 22, our Lord Jesus Christ says of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The day is coming when we will be with him. We will sing to him with all the saints of all the ages. For now we sing together as a group, oh, for a thousand tongues. Let's stand and let's sing to the Lord. Master and 
As I mentioned last Lord's Day, we want to take these fall Sunday months and remember our missionaries in a fall missions emphasis. This morning, I want us to remember Mary Perro. Uh, you, of course, will recall that Roger Perro, Mary's husband, went to be with the Lord this summer. They were hiking. He suffered a massive heart attack. And Mary is still in Ireland with the rest of her family who lives there and has been living there for the past 20 years or so. Our church continues to support Mary at their full support through at least the end of this year. And we want to draw attention to her this morning in our prayers and bring her before the Lord. Our last abounding and thanksgiving offering, which go entirely to the support of missions around the world, our last one coming up will do the same, but in a little different way. So you probably recall, if you've looked at the bulletin, you could see on the back that in the first three abounding offerings, we met our goal for support of our missionaries, both around the world and those who are in their retirement years. Thank the Lord for that, and thank the Lord for the generosity of God's people and the provision of God's people to be able to give. Well, as is true of all of us, just as our costs are rising in this bewildering time which we are all living, the same is true for our mission partners around the world. And they don't have the capacity to simply switch employers uh, to try to find a, a better situation to raise their income. It comes from their dependence upon the Lord, which is dependent upon God's people. So for the last abounding and Thanksgiving offering, what we'd like to do is give an additional gift to all of our mission partners around the world and our retired folks as well. And as an expression of our love for them, as an expression of God's grace to them, using us toward that end to be a blessing in that particular way. So our last abounding of Thanksgiving offering is three weeks from today, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, if you would plan and pray how the Lord would have you give in that particular way. Your Bible is probably close at hand. Would you turn to Psalm 27, please? Our deacons and I met this last week for our monthly meeting. And I conveyed to them in the last two weeks, so much of my time and attention has been given to church people who find themselves in really, really difficult situations. There are eight families in our church that I've spoken with in the last two weeks who are wrestling because of 
the expectations that are now being placed on them by their employer. And they, they don't know what to do. Some find themselves on one side of the issue. Others find themselves on the other side of the issue. There are at least eight families in our church that way and probably more. In the last two weeks, I've spoken with families who are dealing with some very serious challenges in their families. I think one of the things that we are experiencing is we're, we're beginning to see some of the fallout from the sowing that was done initially during the early stages of the pandemic, the isolation from God's people, the isolation from the ministry of the word, the isolation from the body of Christ. We've seen it in the broader culture. We're starting to see it somewhat within the church as well and with God's people. So what do we do? When you find out someone you know and love is really struggling and you don't know what to say, what do we do? Believe it or not, there are many times as I'm engaging with church people, I do not know what to say. But we do know who to point people to. And whom we point people to is far more important, I think, than what we say to them. Maybe you find yourself in one of those scenarios that I mentioned just a moment ago. I want to point the church to Christ. Would you follow along, please, as I read the 27th Psalm? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? We can pause there for a moment. Everyone knows there's a great deal of fear in the world right now. It's expressed in so many different ways. For many, it feels like we are walking around in darkness, can't see the next step to take. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Listen, church, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifice of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. May God's word comfort all of your hearts. Let's pray together, please. Our fathers, we gather this morning on the Lord's day as God's people gathering because of the Lord Jesus Christ, gathering in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 
gathering because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that to you we can cry. Our testimony is that of the psalmist. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Our desire is that of the psalmist. When we are in trouble to cry out to the Lord, our expectation is that of the psalmist. That when all forsake us, when enemies rise up against us, when all around us is encompassing us like a flood, our expectation is that God will be faithful to us. And so we commit as a people of God to be faithful to the Lord. In the sovereignty of God, whatever comes our way today and this week, by your grace, we will be faithful to the Lord. You will not forsake us, and we will not forsake you. We recognize that this life is temporal, and the life to come is eternal. As we read this morning, we know how this ends. It ends with the return of Jesus and the establishment of his eternal kingdom where there will be no night and no sin, no disease, no death. The light of Christ will warm and guide and comfort his people for all eternity. And so in these days which you have appointed us to live, we pray that you would help us to live as disciples of Jesus, trusting God for all things, never doubting God, never unfaithful to God. Oh Lord, as I look at the faces across the room this morning, I know that there are so many who are troubled in spirit, some because of the potential to their careers, others because of current health problems, some because of difficult relational challenges, all of us because of the, the presence of sin both that which is done against us and sin which we give into so easily. Oh Lord, we, we know by experience how weak we are. There is no strength in us. And except the Lord care for us, we would all likewise perish. So together as a church family, we lift up each other. And we ask for the sisters and the brothers in our assembly that you would care for each and that each would find in you trustworthiness of God. That none would think that they are in this alone. That all would run to the Lord that none would be foolish and depart from the Lord, but that all would be wise and turn to their God at every moment of every day. Help your people, I pray. This morning, we remember our sister Mary Pero. We pray that she would know personally the promises that the God of heaven makes to widows. We trust that all of her needs will be met by her God for the work that is ongoing in Ireland, which is now missing a key spiritual leader. We pray that you would raise up the next one to take Roger's place and to minister the word of God to the people, the brothers and sisters who are there. And then, Lord, as we open the word of God this morning, would you help us to understand what we read? 
Would you help your servant to declare faithfully what God says, nothing more and nothing less, for the glory of God and for the good of his people. Thank you for gathering the church together. Thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for giving to us of such an abundance that we can give it away to other people. Thank you for all of this. And as we have been praying, we continue to pray this morning. At a time when the church could grow weaker, would you make us stronger? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. in our scripture reading to begin our worship about the throne of God and of the Lamb. Before the throne of God, we have a strong and perfect plea. His name is Jesus. Let's stand and let's sing to him in a body. been reading this morning about our Lord. We've been singing this morning about our Lord, his magnificence as he sits on his throne. He is the king of kings, and yet he still is the friend of sinners, your friend, mine, and he invites us to come to him with all of our sorrows and our cares. Let's sing together, what a friend.
his arms he'll take and shield thee. Come, we'll find the solace there. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Would you take your Bibles once again this morning and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians? We are in chapter 12 this morning as we continue to work our way through Paul's letter to the members that make up the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Let's begin our reading in the first verse. And we'll read this morning down through the 11 verses, though it would be good for you sometime today probably to read the whole of the chapter. We'll stop at verse 11 this morning. Paul writes, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It won't be long before Christmas is upon us. You say, we haven't even gotten through Thanksgiving yet. I, I'm, I'm aware, but this will help us get to the text. It won't be long until Christmas is upon us. Maybe you remember this experience from your childhood with your siblings, or maybe you remember it last year with your own children. Have you been in around the Christmas tree, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, and watched individuals open their gifts only to see written all over their face or maybe even expressed in their words and actions incredible disappointment at the gift they received. If you have siblings, maybe that happened to you. Maybe you received a gift from your parent and your brother or sister looked at your gift and thought, Really? And this is what I got? And that's what he got? Or maybe you remember as a parent looking at your children and, and, and being so disturbed in your soul because you were giving gifts to your children and you could see it wasn't what they wanted. They thought it was not fair. Maybe even at some point you saw tears coming out and incredibly selfish dispositions from your children. And we all look at that and say, how could that happen? Maybe we did some of that. Maybe no one knew it, but it certainly was the expression of our hearts. It's interesting that in the church at Corinth, one of the problems that Paul has to deal with has to do with the gifts that the church received from God, which brought some measure of conflict within the church. As we read here in the text, God gives to the church a wide variety of gifts and he distributes them to individuals, all of those who comprise the church. And he gives them always for the profit of the whole church. As Paul works his way through chapters 12, 13, and 14, 
verse 7 is his thesis statement, if you will. Everything flows out of verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. We'll get to that in a moment, but let's begin where Paul begins in verse number 1. Concerning spiritual gift, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. There is something that you need to know. But I do think it's important for us as we have studied these first 11 chapters in Corinthians to see the term of endearment that Paul uses in verse 1. Brothers. Important why? Well, if you have familiarity with the book of 1 Corinthians, if you've been with us these many, many months this past year as we've been studying it, you know that on many occasions, Paul rebukes the church at Corinth rather aggressively, right? Remember that one time when he said to him, do you want me to come with a stick? Because I can do that if that's what you want. But I would remind you that he speaks to them as he has and as he will because they are his brothers and his sisters. The rebukes to the church are loving. And I trust church. When we open the word of God and we see from the Holy Spirit of God direction to us as a church or as individuals, that we see it as God's loving rebuke to us to keep us off of the destination which only leads to destruction and returns us the path which leads to life. You remember what the word of God teaches us. If we sow to the flesh, we will reap destruction. If we sow to the spirit, we will reap life. So to the wind, the wisdom writer said, and you will reap the whirlwind. So to the spirit, and you will reap life evermore. What does he wish to speak to them about? He wished to speak to them in verse number one about spiritual gifts. I want to remind you what's going on in chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14. It's a big topic. The topic is problems when the church gets together in its public worship. So where we are right now, all the way through chapter 14, is going to deal with problems when the church gets together and specifically the expression of their gifts. Where we've been previously, chapter 11, verses 17 to 34, you'll remember the rich and well-to-do were eating incredibly well at the Lord's table while allowing the poor to leave and go hungry. At the very beginning of the chapter, you'll remember that believers were coming to worship and engaging in worship activities dressed in ways that offended God. Now here in the text where we are, those who were recipients of the gift of speaking in tongues were elevating their gift and themselves to such a level of importance that the church neither benefited from their gifts nor were they benefiting from the possession of the gifts of others. It's interesting when you read this text that Paul goes back in verse 2 to what they were like before they came Christians. What is true as people in broader culture try to identify is that a spiritual man, is that a spiritual woman? Routinely, it's no different than pagan activities. In the broader attention, it is religious expressions and religious experiences which people use to identify as those must be the spiritual people. So my son-in-law, Fernando, and I have talked about this actually quite regularly about his home country of Brazil. That emphasis is given in his home country of Brazil about the showy things. And if you present in such a way, you give the appearance, well, you must have some measure of spirituality. Because 
look at all that you have experienced. You've had this miracle come your way and this miracle come your way and this activity of the Holy Spirit to you and that activity of the Holy Spirit of you. And I've not had any of this. What's wrong with me? But that is no different than ancient paganism. And religious experiences may garner attention in the broader culture, but not in the church. Why? Because we are not pagans. We are Christians. So in the middle of this discussion about spiritual gifts, Paul goes back to verse 2 to their life before Christ when they worshipped idols. So we probably should look at Paul's word about idols. What was true in the Corinthian church? The church consisted of formal idol worshipers, as does every church. Every believer in the true and living God has in his past idolatry, whether that's Abraham of old, the church at Corinth, or even this church. Idolatry is what we were before we came to Christ, and idolatry is a pagan practice. Paul dealt with this, you'll remember, in chapters 8 to 10, when they were describing their problem with eating meat offered to idols. In verse 2, there's a word that describes the idols. Do you see that in your Bible? It's translated probably dumb or maybe mute. Well, he's not talking about the intellectual capacity, though an idol doesn't have any. He's talking about its ability to speak. When he says the idol is dumb or mute, what he means is this. It is entirely unable to answer or to be more specific, it cannot deliver on anything that you hope it might deliver. I think one of the, one of the most compelling and amazing visual stories in the Old Testament, in my mind, certainly is when Elijah is battling the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. You remember that? Elijah is all by himself. He has no allies that he is aware of. And there is going to be the, the complete fallout. This is it. The heavyweight battle. Who is the real God? You remember how the story goes. Prophets of Baal and Elijah each will set up their altar. They will offer a sacrifice. But the miraculous component will be that the God which provides the fire to the sacrifice, that will be the real God. Of course, we know that in the end, Elijah's God does do that very thing. But you remember, don't you? The activity of the prophets of Baal. It's humorous, actually, when you read it. The humorous part is not only what they did, but of course, I let Elijah's mocking sarcasm of them, right? Hey, how come your God isn't answering? Maybe he is sleeping, or maybe he is gone on a trip. Maybe he's on a vacation. Maybe he doesn't know that you're trying to get his attention. The whole of the Old Testament tells us this is what is true of idols. Listen to your Bible. Isaiah 46 says this. They hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship. They bear it on the shoulder. They carry it. They set it in its place. And there it stands. From its place, it shall not move. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. The psalmist put it this way in 135. They have mouths but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. In the text which we read in verse 2, Paul said, in your previous life, when you were Gentiles, what he means by that is when you were pagans, when you were apart from God, 
you were carried away. That phrase carried away literally translates, you were brought into a moment of ecstasy. That's the translation of that. You had a high. It felt good. And you want it again. And so you run back to that same idol only to discover he can't deliver what you want. There's a word about idols here. Idols promise security, satisfaction, significance, and deliver nothing. I've said often, we've discussed often, the first commandment is the first commandment for a reason. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because the penchant of humanity will always be to identify someone who can give them security other than the God of heaven. The penchant of humanity will always be to identify something that can give them satisfaction that can give them a moment of ecstasy, a high. Something that will make them significant. It's often found in addictive behaviors. Addictive behaviors like alcohol, recreational drug use. Maybe within the Christian community, not as frequently those, but more frequently a satisfaction that is found in having stuff, significance that is found in orchestrating life in such a way that it garners the attention of everyone who looks at you and thinks, I wish I had her life. maybe more so than alcohol or drugs, an idol of pornography, which offers a satisfaction promise that it cannot deliver. Food, just given to gluttony, Wake up in the morning, think about food. Throughout the day, think about food. Go to bed at night, think about food. Because that's what really makes me, it gives me a moment of ecstasy. Work, because that's where I'm most fulfilled, satisfied, comfortable. An idol of amusement. I just want to turn on the television and watch and watch and watch and amuse myself with games and games and games. And the days go by and we find that we are not liberated. But in every passing day, that idol captivates us more because idols never give idols never liberate idols never empower they only take they only imprison and they only incapacitate MacArthur writing on this text one of the most common misconceptions about the ungodly life a misconception shared by many immature believers is that the ungodly life is free in contrast to the Christian life, which is hemmed in by rigid restrictions. As Paul teaches in this passage, just the opposite is true. The unbeliever is a captive of sin and of Satan. He has some choice as to the type of sin, but he has no choice as to whether or not to sin. However you were led, the apostle says, you were led 
You had no choice. Whether you went into idolatry willingly or not, you could not help it. But that's what you used to be. It's not what you are now. Instead, verse 1 tells us that God gives. Idols cannot give because they are not real. Therefore, brothers and sisters, do not give yourself again to idols. Do not do that. If you have an NIV this morning, the NIV translates that phrase, do not be led astray by idols. And then it adds this additional thought, do not be influenced by idols. I find that a curious word in the 21st century, influenced. Because that's become a, a common nomenclature for people on social media who garner all this attention because they are influencers. And what is curious to me is influencers on social media are not uniquely influencing teens and college students, but they are influencing people in their 30s and 40s as if there is something that they can offer which will give to you as a taker of what they have significance, satisfaction, or security. Do not be influenced, Paul says. There is only one God. This God is identified in the very first word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. There is only one God and he is our creator. And unlike the pagan gods, this God is not mute. He has and continues to speak to us. Remember your Bible? Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the words, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is your only God. Do not go back to idolatry. So pagans worship idols. But what is true of Christians? What marks the true presence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life? It's not the ecstatic experiences like pagans have. That's the point of connecting spiritual gifts to verse 2. There is a significant difference of the demonstration of the Spirit of God in a Christian's life than a supposed spirit in the life of an idolater. What's the difference? This is verse 3. A truly spiritual person expresses truth about Jesus. This is basic Christian speech. There's both a negative and a positive. So you see this in your Bible. No one who is led by the Spirit of God curses Jesus. No Christian curses Jesus. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to curse Jesus? My guess is there probably are few in the room this morning who would say that that is something that is true of you, and I would say, great, does it mean to curse Jesus? Anyone who brings an accusation against Jesus curses him. Anyone who seeks to discredit who Jesus is or who Jesus claims to be. Anyone who says that Jesus does not speak for God. Anyone who discredits the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ. All of them curse him. We see this in the Gospels, don't we? 
Think of the many accounts in the Gospels from King Herod at the birth of Jesus Christ to the religious leadership throughout his public ministry, to those at his trial, to those around his cross, even to the malefactors who were on either side of him. Throughout the whole of the public life of Jesus, there are those who are cursing him. That's not Christian speech. No Christian curses Jesus. How do you know the presence of the Holy Spirit is in someone? Well, here's the negative part of it. <coughs> what about the positive part? This too is in verse 3. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So conversely to the negative, here's the positive. Where no Christian curses Jesus, all Christians, at the prompting of the Spirit, identify Jesus as Lord. Now, the word Lord is very familiar to you. It's very familiar to you because of how many times it's used in the New Testament. 700 times plus the word Lord appears in your New Testament. Compare that to Savior. Savior? Less than 10 times. That's not to in any way take away from our Lord as our Savior. It is to elevate the Lordship of Christ in our minds. The lordship and deity and sovereign of Jesus Christ, sovereignty of Jesus Christ was and is central to true faith. Someone who says, Jesus is my sovereign, that comes at the affirmation of the work of the Holy Spirit. It is only by the Spirit of God, the Apostle Paul says, that a person can openly testify to Jesus as Lord. A little bit more about that word, Lord. It's the Greek word kyrios. It's, a, it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Jehovah. So when an apostolic writer, when a New Testament Christian says that Jesus is Lord, he is identifying Jesus as the same God who was the burning bush. Yahweh, Jehovah. To say that Jesus is Lord is a statement of his divinity, his sovereignty, his authority. And it is only by the work of the Spirit that a man can look at Jesus and say, as Thomas did of old, my Lord and my God. Paul says that the evidence that the Holy Spirit has worked to move people from pagans to worshipers is not some kind of showy, ecstatic experience. The evidence is what they convey about Jesus. You probably have experienced this when you've been talking to people in some kind of religious conversation. No doubt you've talked to someone and you have tried to give the gospel and the response to you will be, well, I believe in God. Well, good. Here's what I like to do when someone says to me, I believe in God. I do my best to take the conversation immediately to Jesus. Well, what do you believe about Jesus? And the statement that the Apostle Paul says, an identification that a person has moved from paganism to the new birth, is that that person confesses openly and without hesitation, Jesus is my Lord. He is my authority, my sovereign, my master. The confession Jesus is Lord is a statement that knows full well what it means. It's built on what Paul said earlier in the epistle. When he wrote, you are bought with a price, 
Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is his. To say that Jesus is Lord is a confession that this is true with me. I was bought at a price. It's not merely that I believe in God, whatever that means. Pagans believe in a God. It's called an idol. Christians who do not need experience to justify the presence of the Holy Spirit recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit by how that person thinks about Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Jesus is Lord. All Christians, all Christians everywhere, all Christians past, all Christians present, all Christians future, point to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and never to the superiority of people, which is what's happening in the church at Corinth. So the foundational truth of Jesus' lordship is going to be what guides us in the discussion of gifts that follow. You see, gifted persons in the church are not supreme. Jesus is. That's the point Paul is making. Well, let's see how much farther we can get. In verses 4 to 7, Paul then helps us understand that there is uni unity in diversity. What does Paul acknowledge? Paul acknowledges differences. And Paul elevates unity. In verses 4 to 7, we are introduced really to the idea of spiritual gifts. Well, what are spiritual gifts? Let's get some definitions on the table. Here's one. Theologians like this one. Spiritual gifts are spiritual capacities bestowed on believers to equip them to minister supernaturally to others, especially to each other. In the church, the primary expression of spiritual gifts is within the gathering of a local assembly. Or a second definition, spiritual gifts are the characteristics of Jesus Christ that are to be manifested through the body corporate. Remember, we are Christ's body, right? He is the head. His characteristics are to be manifested in the body corporate just as they were manifested in the body incarnate. Just as Jesus did them himself in his own incarnate body. We too, the church, the body of Christ, are to actuate the characteristics of Jesus through his body corporate. Paul is teaching there is unity in diversity. You see this in verses 4, 5, and 6. There is diversity of gifts in verse 4. Differences of ministry in verse 5. Differences, diversity of activities in verse 6. I don't think there's any benefit really in working through and seeing what each individual word, gifts, ministry, activity means. I think Paul is simply using those words synonymously and interchangeably because of what follows. So you see diversity, difference, and diversity. But look what comes next. In verse 4, same spirit. In verse 5, same Lord. In verse 6, same God. Paul is simply teaching this. Not everyone in the assembly has the same gift or assignment. But the unity that you experience in the assembly does not come from having the same gift or assignment. The unity that you have rests in having the same giver. Hopefully you're sticking with me. So now in verses 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 11, there is a repeated word. The word is same. It actually is really hard to miss the point that Paul is making. 
he says over and again, same spirit, same Lord, same God. Spirit, Lord, God. The Trinity. Paul's point, the triune God is working for the good of the church. Specifically for the good of the Corinthian church. And then more specifically, even to this church. That should be a great cause of encouragement to all the members of this assembly. The infinite, omniscient, omnipotent God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit gives to the church gifts, ministries, activities, which he himself empowers for the fulfillment of his will. His gifts, verse 11 teaches us, are according to his good pleasure. That means that what is gifted to one individual in assembly may not necessarily be gifted to the other individuals in the assembly. In addition to that, it means this, that the gifts which existed in the church at Corinth may not have existed like they exist in the church at Ephesus. Or what existed at Ephesus may not have been the same as what existed in Thessalonica. The God of heaven gifts according to his own will for the work of that particular church. Now, true, all churches have the same mission. We're all called to the Great Commission. We are all called to the building up of believers. But beloved, not all churches have the same gifting. Most of us have been in more than one church. You were raised in a church. You moved here as an adult or a college student, and now you're here. You served at one church as a pastor, another church as a pastor, and now you serve at this church as a pastor. We all know by experiences, not all churches have the same gifting. And we also need to know this then. All churches have been given their gifts by the same God. That leads us then to at least this conclusion. The church is run by God. We are dependent on God individually and corporately. And anything worthwhile that is accomplished in our lives individually or the church corporately cannot be accomplished apart from God. So Paul has arrived at his main point in verse 7. What does he say about this gift, this different and diverse activities and ministry and gifts? Every one of these manifestations, verse 7, is given to each one all the people in the assembly for the profit or for the good of all. Let's think about that quickly. Each one. All in the assembly receive. None in the assembly is excluded. And all receive, according to verse 11, as God himself wills. Well, somebody asks, well, what? kind of gifts do they receive? Well, that's the next verses. Paul lists nine gifts there. The list is not exhaustive. How do we know this? Because we have other lists in others of Paul's writings. He gives additional gifts in chapter 12, verses 28 to 30. In Romans chapter 12, he gives another list of gifts. In Ephesians chapter 4, he gives another list of gifts. The intent is not to list every possible gift. The intent is to show that everyone in the assembly has a gift and those gifts are going to be different according to the will of the giver. But we do need to look at something that's important, I think, in verses 7 to 10. If you underline in your Bible, and if you were to underline, for example, in verse 7, each one, or in verse 8, one, or in verse 8 again, to another, and you did that all the way down through verse 10, probably the vast majority of verses 7, 8, 9, and 10 would be highlighted or underlined. 
there is so much attention given to each one or another that you can't read this and have any doubt that Paul intends to convey that every person in the local church, every one of us, has been the recipient of gifting. What is a gift? It's a special capacity bestowed on a believer for the purpose of equipping that believer to minister supernaturally to others and especially to those in the church. What is a spiritual gift? It is the characteristic of Jesus Christ, which he displayed in his body incarnate, which now we have been equipped and responsible to display in the body corporate. In the list that is here in verses 7 to 10, Paul gives no definitions. He doesn't tell us what the word of the wisdom through the spirit is or the word of the knowledge. He doesn't tell us what that is. Well, why doesn't he do that? Well, obvious he didn't have to tell the church of Corinth because they clearly understood each of the gifts. His purpose in here was not to identify and define each gift. His purpose is to point out that all have the same source to accomplish a unified purpose, the profit of all. Okay. That's a lot of information given to you in like a machine gun style. And maybe you feel like you've just been doused with a whole big 55-gallon drum of water. We're going to come back to this, obviously. But I think we can conclude at least with these pastoral comments, knowing what you already know. Here's the first. By equipping all, can I pause here just for a moment? Can we agree that when we read this text, the text says that God himself has equipped all in the church? Can we agree on that? Is there anyone exempt? No, there's not. All right, so we're in agreement there. By equipping all, our Lord intends the ministry of the church to be carried out by all. Not a few. Well, those who have been around a very long time, those who went to Bible college, those who are generational Christians, not by a few, not by the professionals. Well, that's what we hired you to do. Not by the professionals and not merely by those who have the shiny gifts. The shiny gifts, the ones who have microphones in front of their mouths, the ones who have instruments at their fingers, the ones who are recognized, but instead by all. Those of you in business, you're familiar with the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. The 80-20 rule does not apply in healthy, strong, Christ-exalting churches. Where in a local church, 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people, that's a weak church. That's not a healthy church. That's a church that has missed that there is responsibility given to them in the gifting to every individual for the profit of all. This pastoral comment. By equipping diversely, okay, let's pause there because I didn't ask you if you were in agreement on this yet. You agree that all are equipped. Do you agree that all are equipped differently, diversely? In other words, you don't have the same giftedness as the person sitting next to you, and the person sitting next to you doesn't have the same giftedness as the person sitting behind you. Can we agree on that? By equipping diversely, our Lord intends for all to minister with a measure of individuality. Say, so what do you mean by that? 
I mean this. There are some in any local church who will be passionate about some kind of ministry, verse 5. Who will be passionate about some kind of activity, verse 6. Who will be passionate about some kind of giftedness or manifestation, verse 7. All of it for the profit of all, but unique to that individual. Some will be passionate about some things. Others will find great joy in another thing. This is the intention of our Lord. This is his mind. Therefore, listen carefully. We cannot be irritated with those in the assembly who do not build the church the way that we do. You have your giftedness. And they have their giftedness. We cannot be upset when someone doesn't share a passion for some part of the profit of the church that you don't share. And we cannot belittle the exercise of their gift as not on par with ours. We should never say, why don't they ever volunteer to do something? Well, frankly, if they would look at their giftedness in you, they might say the same thing about you. Think about it, brothers and sisters. If the diversity of gifts bring conflict to the church, we're doing it wrong One more. By equipping all with diverse gifts from the same source, I need to pause here. Can we all agree that this is the same source? That every individual, diversity of gifts, they all got it in a supernatural way from heaven. Can we all agree with that? Okay. By equipping all with diverse gifts from the same source, our Lord produces Unity, love, growth, and fellowship that cannot be accomplished any other way. You say, where do you get that in the Bible? Verse 7, for the profit of all. There is only one way to accomplish this. And it is via the giftedness that comes from our Lord. All church have programs. Some churches have five and ten year plans. They all have their place. But beloved, nothing can do for the health of the church more than what our Lord has originated. I think I've communicated to you previously that Nearly every pastor that I've spoken to, maybe nearly every is too strong a word, so I'll back off of that. Many of the pastors that I have spoken to as they have engaged with churches in the dance that's called candidating. One of the questions that often comes up to the candidate, I've told you this, how will you grow this church? Here would be a great answer to that. Want to see the church grow? Work your gift. What the candidate could say to the the pulpit committee is, I'm going to challenge everyone in this assembly to work his gift. Want to see the church grow? Work your gift. Want to see the church strengthened? Stronger than it is? Exercise your gift. You want to see the church protected? Protected from false doctrine? Protected from from unholy living? You want to see the church protected? Labor at your gift. You want to see the church generous? 
generous in its money, generous in its time, generous in its assets. You want to see the church generous? Practice your gift. You want to see the church joyful? Happy? Satisfied? Content? You want to see that? Engage your gift. Our Lord produces unity, love, growth, and fellowship that cannot be accomplished in any other way by the diverse distribution of his gifts to his church. Our Lord desires good for the church. Our Lord desires good for this church, for our church. Think of how good he has been. He has gifted us individually. You and you and you and you and you and you, 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 and you. He has gifted us individually so that when we exercise our giftedness, the church is better for it. You didn't have to do anything to get this gift. He gave it to you. You don't have to manufacture the strength necessary to exercise his gift. He will empower you to it. He just asks you to exercise it. And the result of that will be a better church for his glory and for the good of people. I hope that helps. Let's pray together, please. Fathers, we bring our worship to a close. We ask your blessing on the people, upon us, as we respond to the word of God. It is our practice here at our church to take these moments at the end of the preaching to respond to God. However it is that you should respond to the Lord Would you do that? Maybe it is that you need to cry out in faith to God because you still are an idol worshiper. Maybe you would cry out in faith, oh God, I am a rebel against you. Would you save me because of what Jesus did on the cross? I confess Christ as my Lord and my God. However, as you should respond, I'll give you the quietness of these moments to do just that.